Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer, and today we're going to have another incredible episode for you guys. As always, and today's overarching theme is going to be democracy's dark days. Are the left turning on democracy? Because we've had a lot of events to make us seem that they're trying to take away our freedom and liberty and trying to cancel elections even, or they're suggesting some of these ideas. So we're going to be talking about that today. Uh, obviously, the big news from last week is Trump turned himself in in Georgia, in Fulton County. He turned himself on the charges of trying to uh, defraud the election. A RICO, you know, there was a conspiracy to overturn the election in Georgia. He turned himself in and then he delivered the now famous mugshot of himself at Fulton County Jail, which you saw, which is a big moment for American history that our president would do this and the mugshot clearly backfired because everyone gravitated towards it or found it a powerful image of Trump of punished Trump of Trump being oppressed by his enemies and looking defiant in the face of this backlash towards him and I argued you know on the you know it was a huge miscalculation on the left to do this because they knew they were going to give Trump a fundraising weapon. They knew they were going to give something to Trump to highlight the horror of this, the tra- the travesty of justice, the the fact that they are turning a former president into a, you know, low-down criminal, that this is helping Trump, that this is helping Trump's cause, especially among Republican voters. Now they could argue maybe it would hurt him among independents, but it's clearly helping him among ordinary Republicans. It's galvanizing them and encouraging them to rally around him as he faces these many threats to his ability to stay out of jail. And the one mugshot, people were wanting to see the mugshot ever since Alvin Bragg charged him. Alvin Bragg knew it was not a good idea to have a mugshot. It's like they couldn't have the perp walk. They didn't want to make it seem that they are trying to humiliate and turn Trump into just a mere criminal. They didn't want to do that. And of course, Jack Smith didn't want to do this either. They knew that this would be a gift to Trump, that this would highlight the wrongness of these prosecutions and would highlight the banana republic aspect of our criminal justice system they did not want the optics of you know a president being handcuffed and mug and have their mug shot taken but fanny willis not as smart as the other ones of course and her county being like entirely black run i mean it's it wasn't probably intentional, but if you were watching the clips leading up to Trump turning himself in last Thursday, it was only black cops guarding the facility, guarding the, the jail where he was going to turn himself in. And that's just likely due to the demographics. I mean, it's a majority black county. Blacks run everything. And yeah, it's obviously going to be... Uh, that's what the law enforcement is going to be like. But they probably do have some white law enforcement, but they had literally no white law enforcement. It's all black guys. And a lot of them weren't in like proper police attire. A lot of them just had like a polo on. I don't, and some of them, it wasn't even tucked in. They're carrying, you know, automatic you know, weapons. And it, came, it didn't have, it had a very bizarre optics to it, even though it was likely not intentional. But Fannie Willis just wanted, we were like, we want to humiliate him. We want to send this message. And then they took the mugshot. And the mugshot was, I think, a huge gift for Trump, at least in the Republican primary. And it took out all the oxygen of his opponents. How can his opponents compete against the mugshot, against these news events? And they look so petty and small in comparison to what's happening to Trump. And this happened to Ron DeSantis, who... Uh, you know, was not having a good week last week. And I mean, the debate didn't go terribly for him, but he didn't get much attention. And then the next day, you know, Trump turns himself in and he's at the Field of Dreams. He's like, well, you know, I'm glad I'm at the Field of Dreams instead. And he's also clearly irritated that someone would ask him about Trump turning himself in. Bad optics. Then he had the mass shooting and he had weird response. I don't think actually when it comes to mass shooting, I'll talk about this a little bit later on but i think with desantis this is one time i felt like actually sat or um i felt pity for him because desantis is not does not have the personality to like connect on these moments 
And it just sounds weird when he's there. And he's like talking about it. I was like, yeah, this scumbag. Yeah, he killed people. And we don't like him killing people in Florida. And it's just like, you need to have a more serious tone here. It sounds like, you know, in this Zach's tone and way he's talking about like one of these frivolous PR stunts he always does. And here it's, you know, mass shooting and he's just stuck there. And then he gets heckled at the event. He looks out of place. I mean, I, I don't think in this situation, I don't think, you know, it is what he is. He is not. He just doesn't have that personality to connect on that level on and on those moments. And people always criticize Trump for the serious moments. You know, if there was something there, um, famous time is him celebrating Baghdadi's death. You know, there was no song. A somber tone to this. This is like a celebration. Well, at least with Trump, he would turn it into something funny. <laughs> I don't know if that was always the best moment, but he always did have a way when he talked to victims of these attacks or, you know, the Gold Star families that they always said that Trump really connected with them. He always said the right things. And that's something you need with presidents because, I mean, now Biden, you know, when he's met with Gold Star families, they all complain about how uh, insensitive he was and how he just didn't understand their pain at all. Well, that's, I don't, I don't want to spend too much on DeSantis, but I'm just saying he didn't have a very good week. But all they, they all look, you know, just so small in comparison to what's happening to Trump. Trump is, you know, sucking up all the attention. They can't get that attention that Trump has in the race. And it very much hurts them. They can't, if they can't do this, like how can they win the election? And, and, you know, this further solidifies his hold on the GOP primary. And everyone continues to he have these theories. I, I know my live chat has all these theories. It's like, Scott, uh, it's guaranteed to be a two-man race and DeSantis is going to kick Trump's ass. Like, the, everyone, you know, they always say that that's like the theory. But in the polling, Trump is is destroying DeSantis by like a double di by like over 20 points when it's a head-to-head. -head. Like even when it comes to head-to-head, -to -head, like DeSantis is far behind. And it's also the theory that they're going to get a head-to-head -head doesn't make any sense. Why, are, why is Vivek and Chris Christie going to drop out of the race in favor of DeSantis? And also there's not a guarantee that someone like Nikki Haley drops out and endorses DeSantis. There's probably a greater chance that she drops out and endorses Trump because she sees the writing on the wall. And maybe, you know, maybe she feels that this could better her chances in 2028 to be on Trump's side or, or to be friendly with Trump. And she clearly doesn't like DeSantis. I mean, none of these candidates really like DeSantis. They don't see him as a strong candidate and they don't they don't want to be there's no reason for them to back a losing horse here. And so it's not a guarantee. You know, I think Pence would drop out and endorse him, but. That's it. I mean, I, I don't think any, I think a lot of the other candidates who would drop out may endorse Trump. Vivek is never going to drop out in favor of DeSantis. And Chris Christie, you know, even if he did drop out, he probably would endorse DeSantis. He really doesn't like DeSantis. And he's going to stay in the race till at least New Hampshire. And Nikki Haley's going to stay in the race till at least South Carolina. And if DeSantis doesn't win Iowa, which, you know, all polls show he's going to lose by a lot there. And, you know, if there's like, you know, three, four or five other candidates still in the race when Iowa happens, you know, he, you know, they're going to be taking up his support. Obviously, Trump's going to win there. So when is DeSantis supposed to start winning and having the momentum? Because all these primaries, as soon as voters start to see someone is going out far ahead in the primary, they all rally behind that candidate. It happened in 2016 when Trump kept winning on the primaries and there was far more institutional opposition towards him and also far more skepticism of him among the Republican base. You know, this is the third time they'd be voting for Trump. They're, they're you know, they're fine with voting for Trump, even though they may have qualms about him. You know, and when Biden, when Biden began to have momentum, they all started to, uh, you know, go to him. DeSantis, I'm not sure when this momentum starts to happening, if he loses all the early primaries, and then that just solidifies greater support for Trump. And then even if he did somehow get a man-to-man -man race, he'd get blown out. So I don't really know. He'd still not win a primary. So I don't even know what the theory is here. Um, and that does really have to do with democracy. But I always just want to emphasize this point. Like, there is no path to victory for 
DeSantis unless Trump somehow gets unless Trump gets convicted before the primary and decides to drop out. But I'm more convinced that Trump will run till the bitter end. But there are attempts to disqualify Trump from the ballot itself because they say that he participated in an insurrection or rebellion. There's a lot of law professors now trying to say this. Uh, Lawrence Tribe, who is uh, really just not a very serious legal theorist anymore, even though he teaches at Harvard. Uh, he he came up with the most ridiculous shit during the Trump administration. I mean, before he was like a well-respected legal scholar, a legal authority, but he came up with the most idiotic resistance stuff during the Trump administration. So uh, you really have to take it with a heavy grain of salt, whatever he says. But he was talking about, uh, they're all talking, there's a few others that are saying that Trump, you know, if you go to the 14th Amendment, he's disqualified about from it because he participated in the insurrection of January 6th. And this would prevent anyone from being on the ballot uh, due to that. Because, you know, the point, a big part of the 14th Amendment was disqualifying all these Confederate leaders from holding office. And to ensure that they, uh, you, know, you know, were not going to, the, the insurrectionaries of the, of the Confederacy would not be running the South anymore. That was a huge part of it. So they're now trying to apply that to Trump. And there's some, you know, movement there to maybe make this happen. There was a false report last week saying that Gavin Newsom was wanting a ballot to remove Trump's name from it. it turned out to be fake news. <laughs> so it was, it's not that. But you can see that if he gets convicted, I think there would be a push from some of these uh, liberal lawmakers in a variety of states, various states. I don't know if California would even care, but probably some of the battleground states that are controlled by Democrats. I could see Michigan trying to push for this, uh, maybe Pennsylvania. Uh, actually, most of the battleground states, uh, you know, there is Wisconsin has a Republican supermajority in the legislator legislature. So I don't know. Uh, I was reading the theories that just the secretary of state of that state could just, you know, uh, v j just on his own say, oh, Trump can't be on the ballot. Uh, that's the theory that's going with. So maybe they could. I could I would definitely see that in Michigan because they're going after the electors there you know, the alternate electors in that state and a couple of others. So it's, uh, you know, they really do want to find a way to disqualify, but it also shows the point of all these prosecutions. It's not about helping Trump. You know, the DeSantis theory is that all the, all the indictments, it's about ensuring he gets the nomination nomination. It's all about DeSantis. They're not going after Trump. They're going after DeSantis. And it's like, you know, if your theory is that somehow the state, filing four indictments against someone is about hurting your chances of running for presidency. <laughs> yeah, you know, filing against your opponent, I think you need a new theory about why you're losing. You know, that's, you should be, uh, theoretically, you should be winning in this, situ in this situation, but <laughs> you're, you're not. No, the point is to ensure that Trump is never going to be president again and goes to prison and they can disqualify him for life from ever from running for office. And this gives the game away. And I don't know, I don't know how much seriously they will pursue this, but I think if they do get a conviction uh, in the January 6th case, that they will, that some of these secretary states will then try to remove him from the ballot in battleground states, which of course that's going to open up a legal battle. Um, but if he's removed from the ballot in, you know, some key battleground states, you know, Pennsylvania, Michigan, um, uh, maybe Wisconsin, Nevada. I don't know if it would be Nevada. I, they may have uh, the Republic. It may be a Republican secretary of state there. Uh, I don't think they, I think the secretary of state in Arizona is, Demo is Democrat. They had a, they had a weird slate there because there was one statewide Republican who won. I don't know if it was, I don't think it was her secretary of state. I know attorney general, lieutenant governor, governor, <laughs> governor obviously are now Democrats, but it may be secretary of state, but Michigan and Pennsylvania uh, obviously would be going for that strategy. You know, that would, you know, if he's off the ballot in two states, you know, that he probably would need for the election, you know, it's going to be very tough for him to run. I mean, it's already going to be tough for him to run if he's convicted, but it's going to be even tougher and it may try to fully, uh, maybe fully impossible if that, if it's, 
if that holds up in court. I don't think it would hold up in court, but maybe it would definitely open up a legal battle. They would definitely try to pursue that measure if he is convicted of those counts related to January 6th and he's the Republican nominee. Uh, I don't know. Republicans would be too frightened to actually pursue that because if they actually tried to remove him as a nominee. They know that Trump would tell all the supporters to stay home and not vote, and they would lose at least ten, at least ten percent of their of their core base, if not twenty percent. I think it would demoralize a lot of the volunteers and activists who would go door knocking and campaigning on the ground for whoever the pre- Republican presidential candidate is. Uh, so Republicans would lose anyway. Uh, they would demoralize a lot of their base. They'd lo- A lot of them would just not show up to vote. A lot of them would not show up to volunteer and to help the Republican ground game in the presidential election, the general election, that is. But all these Democratic actions, liberal actions, are done for the sake of protecting democracy, is safeguarding democracy. Democracy is under threat by elections. There was a New York Times op-ed that didn't actually say what Republicans thought it said. It said the headline was cancel elections. Uh, I I think there was like the original headline also had something to protect democracy. And then all these people like, oh, the liberals want to cancel elections because they're democratic. It's actually instead like this idiotic. it, It was still a silly article. It's about actually we should just randomly choose our elected officials. Uh, they'd be better than people running for office. So it wasn't quite like liberals just saying, let's just let the State Department, the liberal bureaucrats running everything. Instead, it's like, let's just select average Joe randomly from a lottery to be our elected representative, which is just an idiotic idea. It was given a provocative headline to make people read it, but and people read it. And then I read it as like, oh, it's actually not <laughs> like part of what Democrats want. But Democrats have been warning about how elections threaten democracies or threaten democracy regardless outside of this one op-ed. It's not even just America, it's in Europe. You know, anytime Europeans vote the wrong way, that's anti-democratic. They were complaining about that. They keep complaining about that with Orban, that the fact that Hungarians keep voting for it. They've complained about that in Poland, where they vote for a conservative government, who, which is generally more... Uh, immigrant skeptical than other places. They complain that about it that in Germany, where more Germans are wanting to vote for AFD, the A- anti-democratic party, and the Germans are considering the German government is considering banning AFD because they're a threat to democracy because they're doing too so well. Are they appear to be doing so well in polls? They haven't had elections yet, but it appears that AFD could win twenty percent of the vote, which would be a lot, which would, uh, you know, that would be the most that a far right party has won since um, the 1930s in Germany, ever since the, um, you know, ever since they began having elections again after, (laughs) after the war, I wonder what happened in the war, but they began having elections after that. And so they can't say that that's a threat to democracy. They said that Maloney's government coming into power was a threat to democracy. Well, they got proven wrong there that actually they are fully supportive of democracy because Maloney wants to bring in more immigrants and is uh, a slave to the American global order. So maybe they're uh, not thinking she's so anti-democratic now, but they would still think she's anti-democratic for not being pro-immigrant enough or not being fully on the liberal agenda. So they always complained about that in Europe. Uh, Orban has been the worst. I mean, they've always said is like uh, Hungarians embrace, uh, uh, reject democracy by electing Orban. And it's like, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. They keep embracing democracy and democracy is saying we want Orban. But then they say that real democracy means voting for the guy who's getting crushed by Orban. And they've had numerous other candidates to try to challenge Orban. So the guy, real democracy be the guy you know, getting 40% rather than the guy getting the overwhelming majority support. And they're doing that here in America because last last election in the midterms, you know, they kept saying that this may be the last election we ever have. Like Republicans are going to cancel democracy. And what were their evidence is that, oh, uh, well, they won't investigate January 6th uh, and uh, they'll pass a... Uh, election reform laws that would require a greater voter ID and greater protections to ensure that there isn't fraudulent ballots being cast. Uh, all this is apparently going to cancel democracy. And this was just like, you know, 
They literally thought the Nazis were going to come to take power in the midterms, which it was like stupid. And even if you think the Republicans are the National Socialist Party of America and are just going to cancel democracy, you know, the presidency is still in the hands of, of the Democrats. <laughs> and they were not supposed to get an outright majority uh, in the Senate or in like a 60, like 60 vote, like a majority in the Senate and even in the House. And it's like, how is democracy just canceled? But it was just all these, like, you know, it was just a line they ran with. And they were able to fear monger about this because CNN and MSBC, every damn segment leading up to the election was saying that, like, democracy may be over after November. It's like, democracy may be canceled. This may be the last election we ever have. And it's like, really? It's like, how are we, how is that true? I mean, some of their other theories saying that these state governments, if you have a Republican, strong Republican supermajority, and these state legislatures with a Republican there that they could just hand over their votes to Trump in 2024 or whoever the Republican is, regardless of whether the whatever the vote is, which even though some people who are listening would hope for that, I don't even think that would happen. I mean, look at what happened in 2020. Uh, they didn't have they didn't do that in Arizona. They didn't do that in Georgia. Obviously, both those states were heavily Republican controlled and they would possibly have had the power to do so and they chose not to do that so uh, i don't think that even in the opportunity that they sort of had in 2020 they didn't even take it i don't know how it would have been different in 2024 but they uh you know they were really fear-mongering about this and that they were saying the to protect democracy you have to vote for democrats and I don't know how well the argument worked because, I mean, this was this was a central thrust to their argument. I mean, they only they pretty much ran on three things is like threat to democracy slash January 6th slash Trump bad. That was one. And then two was abortion, which obviously definitely helped them. Uh, Republicans and conservatives don't want to admit it, but it did. And then third was Ukraine, which I don't think really played much of a role in the election at all. But the, also the support for Ukraine is about saving democracy, even though Zelensky's government isn't really a democracy, <laughs> is as much of a democracy as Putin's government, uh, which they don't want to admit. So this rhetoric is going to be even more heated and unhinged as the year progresses and into 2024. And this is what they're going to run with. I mean, that was Biden's uh, ultra MAGA Republican speech where he had, you know, the dark Biden speech where or, or dark Brandon rather um, meme where he had the, you know, the menacing red, red and black background. And he was like threatening them as like these guys want to destroy our democracy, but we're not going to let them. We're going to crush them. It was a very weird uh, speech and I always thought it was going to hurt him, but apparently it didn't. And so they're probably going to run with this stuff again. They probably felt it did well. I don't know how well it did, but it, it is a part of Democratic strategy going into 2024 to betray Republicans as the extremists and Democrats as the moderate party. Well, uh, of course, me and, and the listeners know this is bullshit, but it may work on some of these voters. And it has helped with the abortion issue. The abortion issue does help the Democratic um, strategy in that regard, even though you could say the Democrats are more extreme because they want abortion up until the moment of birth. Um, so there are some things you could say that Democrats, and obviously Democrats don't want to enforce any immigration laws and want to have open borders. I mean, they would be clearly seen as more extreme, but Democrats have and, and i think this work to republicans advantage are rather portraying the democrats as just so extreme you don't want them in power this really helped republicans in 2021 uh, especially with the covid lockdowns which we'll get to in a moment uh, because people are worried they may be coming back and it did help them and in that case but by 2022 democrats thanks to media manipulation were able to betray republicans as the real extremists and maybe this may happen in 2024 it probably will <laughs> they may have an easy time if the uh republican presidential nominee <laughs> is convicted is a convict but uh we will see what happens and how that plays out but that's really one of their strategies they're going to go with 
And it's animating the whole prosecution of Trump. And this one thing has to be kept in mind. This is not just about Trump. This is about taking out the Republican Party and all these battleground states. This is what they're doing in Georgia. This is what they're doing in Michigan, where they've charged these alternate electors. And they're probably going to charge alternate electors in Arizona. In Arizona, it includes the state party chair. Uh, Kelly Ward was one of the alternate electors. So it was you know, other important Republican officials. And it's the same in Michigan. A lot of these guys are like county chairs and, and things of that sort. They are, you know, heavily involved in the state party. And in Georgia, they charge the former state party chair and they may even charge the current state go uh, state lieutenant governor. So they're going, they're trying to cut, uh, really cut at the knees, these state parties with this. And the DeSantis people and a lot of Republicans just like, cheer it on because they are so blinded by their hatred of Trump that they don't care that liberals are now taking out their entire party apparatuses in, in these key battleground states. And they're trying to do this in more of the cases with the alternate electors. The alternate electors is really dark. Uh, I remember when they charged the Michigan stuff because I had already been prepared for the Trump indictments. Uh, that is dark in its own way, but I guess we were you know, it's not that much of a surprise, but the Michigan stuff is like really, really dark because uh, it's like all these like old boomers who just signed a piece of paper didn't commit a real crime and they're trying to throw them in jail for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years under these charges they have. And all the charges are outrageous. And they're trying to do that again in Georgia, which their only crime was signing a piece of paper. Or in the lieutenant governor's cases, sending out a tweet saying we should have a special uh, uh, session of the state legislature to hear uh, whether we should, you know, what to do with our electors, which doesn't sound like much of a crime, but, you know, apparently that's a real serious crime. And they're going to try to do the same in Arizona. Uh, other states that they're not going to do, because I actually looked this up because there were seven states where they had an alternate uh, slate of electors. Georgia, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arizona, New Mexico for some reason. I didn't know that New Mexico was <laughs> close, but they did come up with an alternate slate of electors. And Nevada are all there. That should amount to seven. Uh, hopefully my math is there. So we got one Georgia, two Michigan, three Pennsylvania, four Wisconsin, five New Mexico, six Arizona, seven Nevada. Hopefully our, hopefully our counting skills are doing well today. But uh, when I looked this up of like where else they could be charged, Pennsylvania, New Mexico, apparently they signed a clause saying that they would only be alternate electors if a judge approves it and says it's legal. I think a federal judge, which gave them uh, protection from future charges. It appears that in those states, they're not going to be charged due to that, that clause that said they would only be alternate electors if a federal court approves of it, or I think any court. Uh, Wisconsin, apparently there is some state law that prevents the AG from going after them. Uh, the AG wants to charge them, but the, some state laws have to be changed. Nevada, the AG has said, said in May that they're not going to face state charges. I guess this could change uh, because I think in May it was, I think that was before Michigan charged them. But uh, the state AG in Nevada says they're not going to face state charges. The state AG there says that there's not a statute to charge them with. So there's only the one place that they would do is Arizona, which is going to set up a big fight because it's also it's much closer to the current state party than even in the other states, which I, I don't think with Georgia, it's like their former. It's a lot of this former state party apparatus. They have a new one following the 2022 elections. And obviously the governor is thrilled with these uh, charges and so are as many other state officials. Uh, like Brad Raffensperger and some of the other these other guys, they're totally supportive of the charges and eliminating their political opponents within the party. Their Trump supporting opponents in the party, uh, so they're you know half the state party is thrilled with this and is cheering them on. In Michigan, I don't think it's as um, I think it's also they've had a new state party party apparatus since 2020, and 
you know, it's there's not as prominent, but in Arizona, it's the state party apparatus that would be charged. I mean, it's like Kelly Ward. Kelly Ward is like the, one of the most powerful Republicans in the state, and so are the other people involved. It's the real power players in that state who would be getting charged. And it's also, <clears throat> you know, a state where they're going to have a, you know, their election is going to be all over uh, those charges, especially when it comes to the Senate race, which Carrie Lake is likely to get be getting into. And I bet a lot of her associates are going to be charged in this. So it's going to be a brutal thing. And they are very clear about this, that they're wanting to make charges. Even the governor uh, made a statement saying that we hope they get charged. And seeing what's happening in Georgia, Michigan, they're probably going to go with that. It's unclear. There's also uh, out there's also a possibility that they may charge Trump in those um, in those indictments as well. So that's something to see. It's like Arizona's next, but they feel that they're they have to do this. They feel they they are empowered to do this and emboldened to do this. And I always felt like this is the most ridiculous charges that a federal court would obviously throw out these charges if they if they came before them, especially if it's a Republican appointee. But I don't know. I, I'm actually more concerned that now all these people who just signed a piece of paper are going to be facing like at least 10 years in jail for the crime of signing a piece of paper. And it's very, it's very horrifying state of America to see this happening, but it really is about sending a message. It was the same with what they did with the January 6th protesters. It's what they're doing with Trump. It's about, you know, sending a message. It's about like, you know, beating your opponent, breaking their back and saying, don't fuck with us anymore. You, we are in control and you have to follow our rules. And, and it's, it is having the effect of, at least when it comes to January 6th, because the right doesn't do public demonstrations anymore. <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing. But they really wanted to ensure that there could never be a, another January 6th. And sure enough, the January 6th prosecutions have done that. Uh, both through, you know, imprisoning a lot of the people who would try to organize it. And two, with, you know, intimidating people from ever wanting to do these type of public demonstrations again that's why there's been no protests over trump because people the over the january 6th prosecutions the people would organize it or some of them are facing uh, several years you know 30 years in jail they're trying to get these proud boys um who you know just organ you know organize some of the protests that went around the capitol you know they're trying to hit them with 30 over 30 years in jail and even some of the Oath Keepers, you know, they're appealing to, you know, they got like uh, the main guy, Stuart Rhodes, got 18 years. The, the federal government's appealing to make it longer. You know, they don't like the sentence for because they said it's too short. So they've really punished a lot of these people. And people are really are rightfully afraid of doing this stuff again. And they have the power and the state has the power to do this. Everyone always wants to say like, oh, this is a sign of the weakening of the American state, the weakening of the regime. It's only a weak regime would do this. It's like, um, no, I think the regime looks pretty fucking strong. <laughs> it's like they're getting away with it. It's like you would say this is weak if there are th if their authority can't be, you know, overturned. Like say, you know, the federal government wanted to extradite Trump from Florida. And DeSantis said, we're not going to extradite him. And then the federal government had no means of forcing Florida to do that. That would be a sign of a weak regime. Uh, right now, that didn't happen. And DeSantis didn't want to do that for a lot of reasons. I don't think Trump uh, even asked him to do that. But they know they couldn't do that under this, under this current um, um, standard we have, under this current system we have. It's just going to be impossible to do. And I think it is like a lot of cope to say, oh, the we this is a sign of a weak regime. It's on its last legs. It's like, uh, I don't think everyone getting arrested and no real backlash happening <laughs> is a sign that the regime is on its last legs. I think it's like uh, the Empire Strikes Back. And, but unlike in the Star Wars, you know, there's not the rebel alliances and getting stronger and more resilient in that. It's like the rebel alliances instead, uh, you know, boycotting Target and Bud Light and, and listening to the latest uh, MAGA rap and, you know, zoning out. They're not, they're not, you know, going to another planet to hatch another plot that will bring down the empire or to strike back at the empire to make them feel that the people's will you know, it's really that this regime is imposing its will on the country and there's 
not really much weakness being shown. I don't know why people always go with that. It's not it's not honest to say that, but I guess it's necessary to give some people some hope and white pills. But uh, you know, I think it's it's just a fact that the if the regime wants to arrest you and charge you with stuff, is that there's not much preventing them from doing that at this moment. You know, the regime is not threatened by you saying the regime is on a way to collapse on Twitter or as we call it X now. Uh, you know, that's not. <laughs> they're not just by you tweeting it doesn't mean it's real and i think a lot of people think that if we all tweet this stuff that it makes it real but in real life uh something else is happening i don't think that and some people say that the solution is like oh we gotta look beyond elections we're gonna do something else and it's like what <laughs> If you're not participating in elections, you're giving them all even more power to crush you. You know, even if you have your little community out in, out in the hinterlands doing nothing, you know, that makes it easier. Like, what's to oppose their power? What's to oppose their power grab? And what's to oppose them from arresting you? Nothing. And you could say, oh, well, we'll tweet about it or we'll telegram it. Even worse, they'll telegram it. They, <laughs> the, guy, the regime really fears that. So I, I think people need to be a little bit more realistic and honest about this stuff. Um, I don't see it as like the regime collapsing. I just feel that they uh, can tap into the power. And, and some you may see that it's, you know, taking the veil of what real American power is and what the regime is really like before a lot of people. But otherwise, like people, I don't know, I feel like a lot of people are just shrugging their shoulders at this stuff. And, it, and as I said, the, the arrest in the alternate electors is something very bad. I don't think it's uh, good at all. Uh, but they're able to, uh, they're wanting to do it and they're getting away with it. So hopefully, I mean, them beating their charges would be very good. And I hopefully it does. And I think even the Georgia case, I think is if they get it done, if they push it into federal court, which is what they're trying to do, I think that Trump and the other people charged will win in their case. I'm not as confident as in the other cases. Uh, just because, I mean, Florida, I think they, they could get a hung jury just by the, the setting of where it is. And uh, the D.C. one, unfortunately, by the setting of where it's taking place, it won't work. And the Manhattan one, if it was charged anywhere else, they would uh, a judge would just throw it out. It's so ridiculous. But here in Georgia, I am confident that they would win their cases. And I think still think in Michigan that they would win their cases as well. But it is bad that they're still getting charged. I mean, they have to waste... Tens of thousands of dollars, most uh, likely hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, on these cases. They're going broke, and it's about intimidating and threatening them and sending a message to Republicans that you don't do this again. You accept our election results, and that's it. And it's, uh, it's a frightening moment for us to have in America. And there's other worrying things that could happen, too. <clears throat> One is the um, racist mass shootings that continue to happen or they continue to blame. Uh, once again, as I've always said with mass shootings, these aren't have any real political motivations. Even with the transgender one, I mean, it is fo so funny. With the transgender one, uh, there was no political implications at all. They've still hidden the manifesto. Uh, they've even blamed the the school for the mass shooting. They are they've blamed Tennessee lawmakers for the shooting. Actually, what happened afterwards is they blamed Tennessee lawmakers both for uh, having. Uh, you know, very open gun laws, you know, no, you know, being very opposed to gun control. And two, that they were, you know, oppressing all these L the LGBT community. And this is what happened. So they essentially were defending the shooting there. And then once the shooting is committed by, you know, a group that they don't like, they immediately politicize it and say, oh, the manifesto actually really matters here. Well, the manifesto didn't matter at all in Nashville, the Nashville Christian school shooting. And we just couldn't, we couldn't understand why they, this person did this. There's, don't politicize this shooting unless you are politicizing it to demand gun control and to demand that the Tennessee respect its LGBT community more. But now they're going straight to uh, politicizing the Jacksonville shooting. I, I don't think that there, any of these things really have a political motivation. I think that it's all deranged people and we, America's full of deranged loners who are, you know, they have nothing else going on in their lives, so they feel that the best thing that they can do is just uh, kill innocent people. And it's any time that this has happened, whether it's a Buffalo shooting or I think it was a Dal the Dallas suburb shooting. I forget the exact Dallas suburb shooting where it was like a, 
a Hispanic with swastika tattoos killed people, and they're like, this is a white supremacist shooting. And then I'm like, uh, the shooter is brown. How does this work? It was just such nutso America. And this is, once again, just a, another sign of insane asylum America. It's like, what type of political message is sent by just shooting random people at a Dollar General? It just, it's just insane. Only a, a, like a nut job would think about doing this. And I, But the thing I worry about is that a lot of these shootings, whether... And it's not, most of them aren't just even political. It's just like people lashing out. It's just like crazy people wanting to do this. Is that they would use this as a justification to calm down on online speech and, you know, try to push hate speech laws, which is what any time these shootings happen is that they immediately go to. They immediately go to about how, oh, they're spreading hate. Can you believe this? You know, they're asking you know, Vivek Ramaswamy about like, oh, can you believe this? All this online hate. Don't you think we should do something about this? That's always the implication that happens. That's always the solution to these problems whenever it happens with these cases. And I think it does worry because I think that these mass shootings are going to happen more and more. Uh, whether that's the guy saying that's for some, you know, political cause, whether he's... Uh, <laughs> some type of like brown Nazi or whether it's just a transgender shooter or or just some crazy person who doesn't have a real motive just that they're you know angry at the world or they're an incel or whatever you know that these are just going to happen more and more because we're a f fucked up country we're we're an insane asylum country when it comes to this stuff and that's the real that's the real explanation for all these shootings it's nothing the people just like throw on a political meaning to these shootings are you know after the fact you know, this guy in this shooting, you know, he's had mental health I issues throughout his life. I think even when he was a teenager, you know, they had a court order against him uh, to look at for him because he's, you know, so disturbed. So I think that's something to, to keep in mind whenever these shootings. But I'm always worried that it could go after uh, speech and stuff and that the more these times happen, then maybe that's the case. But I am getting, you know, it is remarkable how little attention this stuff is getting now. Maybe it's becoming so common. I remember the Buffalo shooting. That was like the top news story for a week. This Jacksonville shooting, uh, at least on Twitter, I, I think on cable news is covered a lot more than on Twitter, which is showing the major gap between what people are talking about on, well, it's now X versus, you know, cable news. Maybe there is a huge divergence between what we're seeing. There is even a bigger divergence of what we're seeing on social media versus what normal people are thinking. Uh, I've been saying something along that sorts, but... That could be the case even with this mass shooting, which on social media, like nobody was really talking about it um, from our, I mean, except for like DeSantis' response and maybe cable news was just having wall to wall coverage. So there's that gap, but it feels as there's not as much attention to this stuff paid before, but maybe we're just getting so used to it, so desensitized to it that it just doesn't, you know, it's just another day in America when this stuff happens. And I mean, there was a mass shooting at an Oklahoma football game, uh, Involving magical individuals, so that's not a, a concern. Whenever that's always the funniest thing when the ma when the mass shooting happens, it's like, oh, this is terrible. When they think it's like a white supremacist or some deranged white person, they're like, oh, we need full coverage. And then once they see a uh, house party, uh, like twenty wounded, only one dead, they're like, oh, uh, mm, uh, maybe this wasn't a white supremacist. And they just think it's like gangland shooting, and then they immediately drop the case when it turns into you know, blacks shooting each other. There's been a couple, there's, there's been a couple of times where there's like fatalities from these, you know, they're usually have a bar fight or some type of gang fight and multiple people are shooting at each other and lots of innocent people get killed in the crossfire. You know, once they learn that it wasn't just a, a deranged, what the media's impression of a mass shooter should be, or the media's image of a mass shooter should be, they then change it. The, they then change the topic and it's nothing to worry about. And you have to remember is that the vast majority of mass shootings are committed by blacks is that, you know, a New York Times study from I think it was 2016 found that 75 percent of mass shooters that could be identified uh, were black because it's mostly, you know, drive by shootings are these like how block parties where some guy steps on another one's shoe and then they start shooting. That's like most of the mass shootings. Um, it's very rare to that we have the cases that we saw at the Jacksonville Dollar General. 
But all that aside, I think one thing we need to keep in mind is that when these we're having these assaults on democracy and freedom and liberty, a lot of the right is like, this is great. We need to get rid of freedom and liberty and like we're, we're anti-democracy and we shouldn't have any rights, uh, which, you know, maybe in your ideal state that that could be the case. But we're not anywhere close to anyone's ideal state. You know, we're not we're not anywhere near the Habsburg restorationist absolute absolutist monarchy in uh, the new world, you know, whatever you want to imagine. We are in the United States of America. And right now, a lot of these freedoms and liberties that we have are to our benefit. They're usually not something that, you know, taking those away would hurt us more. You know, if people, you know, start saying, oh, we should try to limit freedom of speech and other things. Well, that would most impact us. Uh, very few people are for gun control, so I don't even really have to argue for that. But even when it comes to democracy, it's like people, you know, if somebody wrote like for an NRX blog, like cancel elections and people would be like, this is awesome. And if actually elections are a benefit to us, they usually, um, they usually, they're not, maybe not going so well for us, but if we just allowed experts to have complete control, that would be even worse for us. And a lot of our fundamental rights and freedoms are being taken away. And I think it's much more beneficial to us to uphold them and defend them and appeal to them rather than to uh, pretend you are uh, an absolutist monarch monarch living in the 17th century and then saying, uh, no one should have rights. The freedom of speech should just be determined by the monarch. Uh, you don't have a monarch. We, ha we live in this country. So I think if you're living in the real world, not in a fantasy, you're wanting to defend freedom of speech. You're wanting to defend the right to bear arms. You're wanting to defend the right to have elections. <laughs> uh, of course, you should have election reforms to ensure that there are fewer uh, fraudulent votes cast. But it's all, and we should have freedom of association and many other things. I think a lot of the right in America needs to appeal to what a lot of Americans believe. And they are value, and that's freedom and liberty. And conservatives, of course, turn these terms into very cringe terms that embarrassing terms and use them in a way that was very stupid but they use them because they're very popular among the american populace and in order to convince the american populace to vote for what we want and to support what we want you have to appeal to those fundamental principles and portraying our enemies as the as the enemies of freedom of liberty is a good tactic for us and it's a true tactic we're being honest and I think you do have to do that because if you a good pitch to them is to say, if we let the left wins, we are going to lose freedom and liberty forever. And I think that's a powerful pitch. I think that's a powerful appeal. And we should use more of it rather than LARPing as, uh, you know, as Hopsburg reps restorationist in the 21st century. I mean, if you want to believe in that, that's fine. But that's like a live action role. You know, just keep that to your real time strategy game or to your role play game. You know, in the real world of politics, it's that doesn't really have a place there. Now on to the next topic. Actually, there's one thing I want to talk about uh, with also right wing fantasies versus reality. Uh, this is, uh, I, I don't, I want to preface this by saying I'm not criticizing Tucker and I'm not agreeing with liberal takes of Tucker, but Tucker Carlson ha was giving a speech in Hungary and says that the reason why they're attacking Hungary is because it's a Christian state. And the reason why they're, and it's the same reason they're attacking Russia as a Christian state. And someone put a community note pointing out how unimportant religion is to the ordinary lives of Russians and Hungarians. I can already hear the people shrieking in the comments over this. But, the, but only about 7% of Russians attend church regularly, and only like 17% say religion is important to their lives. With Hungarians, it's under 19% who say religion is important to their lives. For Americans, it's nearly half of Americans say it's very important to them, and it's about a quarter that say it's fairly important. So, uh, including very and fairly important, it's you know close to 75%. So that's a lot. <laughs> and more Americans attend church regularly. It's about 33% that attend church at least monthly. And Americans are more likely to pray than anywhere in Europe on, on a regular basis. And so Americans are more religious than anywhere in Europe. But I think, I think what happens here is that a lot of the right get really mad when you point this out, which I don't understand because at one time, on one hand, they're predicting that Christian nationalism is about to take over the country. 
Yet then they predict that everyone in America is an atheist or a Satanist. And it's like, well, hold on. Do you think that Americans are more religious than and are willing to adopt, you know, Christian nationalism? Or do you believe that we're, you know, all God forsaken atheists of some sort? And people can't really figure this out. And they get really mad when you point out this about Russia and Hungary, which I don't understand. As it's just true. The difference between, you know, America and Russia and Hungary is that there's more public religious expression in these countries. And that's just due to them being more homogenous when it comes to religion, is that there is a set religion that is the predominant one, a denomination that's the predominant one in both countries. In Hungary, it's the Catholic Church. In Russia, it's the Russian Orthodox Church. And they're closely aligned with the state and the nation. And that's what the vast majority of their population belongs to, at least nominally. Even though Orban himself is Protestant, but, you know, he respects the the religion of the majority of his population. You know, in America, you know, we're still generically, generically Christian, but it's, you know, there's not a, a dominant denomination. And also the type of Christianity we have is a very individualistic one that is not given over to public expressions or public festivities. I mean, it was mostly like a low church Protestantism that is very much focused on the individual rather than, you know, having ties to the state and having those close connections that would have these cultural celebrations. So that was like very much always, the, you know, very similar in the case of that. You know, of course, at times when it was you know, it agreed that America was a Protestant nation. It reflected, you know, Protestant values and there was more Protestant public expressions of that, you know, such as Bible reading in schools. Well, that hasn't been the case in 60 years. So, but Americans themselves are more personally religious than Russians and Hungarians, but there is more public religious expression or at least public expression of the majority religion than in Hungary and Russia. And it's part due to just because that's seen as part of their culture. It's a not just religion. It's also expression of their culture, expression of their ethnicity and many other things that's tied with religion. While religion is more seen as an individual choice, a personal choice that you gravitate towards in America. And it's something that's kept to your private life rather than something that's shared with the entire community or in the entire nation. And so that's a, that's probably a real difference. I don't know why people, but people get really outraged by this. I don't know why they want to pretend this, but it, it is true. I mean, Russians and Hungarians don't, and, and that's just true throughout Europe. I think really Poland has the highest church attendance rating. I think um, uh, it's like 35 or 35% that attends mass weekly, which is pretty high especially compared to the rest of Europe. Most of Europe, it's under 20% <laughs> everywhere in every country. It gets, it gets even lower in Orthodox countries for whatever reason. Maybe it's due to all these countries being controlled by the Soviet Union. But Greece wasn't controlled, or not controlled by the Soviet Union, but being communist for so many years. Uh, Greece wasn't controlled by the communists, and it still has a low church attendance rating. But uh, that's a discussion for another day. But I, I don't get why people all get worked up. But uh, going to the other point on Tucker saying that they hate them because they're Christians, sort of, I don't want to totally dismiss it, but I know what he is trying to say, but it's really they hate them because they're white nations that stand up for themselves against the power of the globalist American empire. And I've had a lot of criticism of Russia. I think we're seeing a lot of the problems with Russia over uh, the Prigozhin killing, which I didn't, uh, you know, I've really talked about in this podcast, but um, you're really seeing that it is, <laughs> it is bad for a state to just like regularly kill like random leaders <laughs> who, who run afoul of the major leader. And some people are like, this is awesome. And whether you th think Prigozhin deserves it or not, I mean, Prigozhin should have known what was going to happen when he had a mutiny and it didn't work. I mean, this was going to be the result. But at the same time, there's all this always happens in Russia with opponents of, of Putin. And maybe people want to defend it, but it doesn't create a high rate of stability when people know if they do something wrong, that they can have all their wealth confiscated and they themselves can be shot. You know, that prevents a lot of the smartest and most competent people from doing things, from, you know, trying new ideas and trying to further things outside of the box because... That will just keep people, you know, rigid and fall in directions. It's like, you know, Soviet Union or Stalin. 
you know, they were all afraid of getting killed by Stalin. Of course, Putin is not on the same leg of Stalin, but I'm just, it's a similar mentality where people don't want to show any initiative. They don't want to do anything new and different because they're worried that that could end up them getting killed. And here in Russia, it's more that they'll just end up, most of the time they aren't killed. They're just, you know, shown pow- disfavor from power and they lose a lot of their wealth and they maybe have to exile themselves. So it doesn't, it's not really quite the, <laughs> it's either, you know, a, a horrible totalitarian regime or it's just, you know, a kind of a corruptocracy where they can't get really major accomplishments done. As we're seeing with, in Ukraine, which, you know, it's a, I'm never saying that they're totally losing. I think it's just a stalemate that eventually Ukraine is going to have to accept that they're going to have to cede parts of their, their country they claim to Russia but it's not working in the way that Russia intended at the beginning. And a lot of it's due to the type of people that rise to the ranks of general. You know, they're not in, you know, these are just like fief- feudal lords who rose up there through corruption. And they're mainly worried about enriching themselves rather than winning the war. And, and also not risking the wrath of those superior to them. It's not a type of uh, thriving civilization you want. But that's otherwise. Uh, that's all I would say about Prigozhin. I think it's most of most of that has already been stated. But I just want to get that out of the way. But I think it's really to why the state hates Russia and Hungary. It's because they are majority white countries. For Hungary, it's a pretty much entirely white country that stand up for or stand up against the global American Empire's agenda, and they do things differently, and then they. They hate them for that reason. I mean, the main reason they hate them is not for, well, for in Hungary's case, it's not for like Christian expressions. It's the fact that they refuse to take in migrants and the fact that they refuse to let these NGOs promote diversity and multiculturalism in the state. That's the real reason why, which you could say maybe has some bearing on Christian, but it's more about the fact that it's a white country standing up and wanting to remain white. And in Russia, there's a couple of other things that work, but it's also they, they're they hated for being a majority white country that appears to be right wing and reactionary and not going with the flow of the gays agenda. And that's why they're hated. Maybe you can, I don't think saying that they're hated for being Christian is totally off base, but I think the real motive is that they hate them for being white countries that don't follow the gay agenda. That's why. And maybe that has something to do with Christian. And you could say that has something to do with them being Christian. But uh, calling them type of the Christian nations that they're like all firmly devout and all really stressing the importance of religion, probably not true. But they do allow for more public expression due to the fact that there's a majority religion in both countries. And that's tied deeply into their culture. And they're allowed to express themselves for that reason, much more so than in America. And the third and final topic didn't get really talk much about Prigozhin because I think it says it all. And people people really hate my Russia takes on the, <laughs> the thing, so maybe I shouldn't uh, talk too much about it. I'm sure people are going to be extremely mad about me saying that Russia is not the most uh, thriving and stable country in the universe, but uh, it is what it is. I mean, it's very much like a mafia-run state. I mean, you could say that's good or bad. It's not. It's just observing fact. It's how it's run. And there are a lot of problems that come with that. Does that mean we should develop, devote all these resources to stopping them in Ukraine or seeing them as our number one geopolitical enemy or not trying to have better relations with them? No, that's not what the argument. But it, you do have to understand what reality is. It is like a mafiosa state. Uh, the way they operate and the way they conduct business, you know, it's very corrupt. They just like kill people <laughs> who oppose them. And, you know, it doesn't create the type of... Um, successful civilization and state that you that you exactly want as you can see with the way the war is going in ukraine but that aside now we're going to go to a topic that it's going to be our third week of discussing but this guy keeps making news and we keep having to talk about him and of course it's oliver anthony uh with him it's last week he disavowed his republican supporters or disavowed republicans utilizing his song to promote the Republican Party, because at the GOP debate last week, the first question was about the Richmond, North of Richmond, and DeSantis tried to embrace the song as his. It's like, we're going to go after the rich man, North of Richmond. And then Oliver Anthony said, that there's it's not right or left. Like, this is just a 
anti-politician or anti-Richmond, and it's open to everyone in America. And this is the, the response. The funny thing is, it's like a direct attack on DeSantis because DeSantis was the one who embraced the song and talked about it at the most of the debate. And instead, all DeSantis fans were celebrating the response because they felt that it was an attack on Trump supporters or, or Nikki Haley or something. But it was really more of an attack on DeSantis than anyone else. Um, and people have debated the response over, over time. And they're saying like, well, he wasn't disavowing conservatives. Well, he wasn't. He was actually, you know, even showing greater support for right wing populism by his response and what what came of it. And he kept having a differing level responses. And then some liberal outlets were claiming that he was showing support for Joe Biden. And then he issued another response saying he did not support Joe Biden. There was also an attack on Joe Biden. But it was a non-political song. It was, um, you know, a, an enlightened centrist song. And this follows his comments in a Fox News interview where he said that the core value of America that we need to bring back is that diversity is what makes us strong. And we're a melting pot. And... Uh, <laughs> A lot of people were criticizing that remark, but then a lot of other people were defending him. People were still strongly defending him, even though he disavowed any type of right-wing interpretation of the song. And that's really what it has to mean. It's not that he's insisting on, or not just insisting on, that his song is a critique of all D.C. politicians. It's a specific disavow of all of any right-wing interpretation of a song. Which is silly because it's obviously a conservative protest song. It's complaining about taxes. It's complaining about our politicians being pedophiles. It's complaining about how our tax money goes to welfare cheats. Does that sound... That is specifically conservative. That is the right-wing agenda right now. And it, he was also the beneficiary of conservative support. I've been told that the guy who recorded the video worked at a conservative media outlet. And as I've been pointing out, like Jason Howerton, who's a longtime conservative media operative, seemed to have gotten and started working with him very early on. Whether he was working with him before the song came on or after, he became like helping him with PR. And so he is a much of a very much of a product of the conservative marketing sphere. Is the he is a side of the conservative consumer demographic and his success is a testament to the power of the conservative consumer demographic. <clears throat> you know, it's not like just his song just connected with, you know, liberals and everything. You know, it's specifically connected with conservatives, and they're the ones who made it a hit. It's, of course, expanded beyond that conservative base, which is why he's doing this. But it's also silly to pretend that it's not a conservative protest song. As I said on Twitter, it's like Green Day saying America, disavowing a left-wing interpretation of American Idiot. Or several other bands are like saying... Uh, uh, you know, Bruce Springsteen doesn't want any type of liberal interpretations of his songs. You know, those the liberals are very open about their political preferences. They are they are never shy away from them. They openly endorse candidates. They love their music being used by Democrats. They love this liberal interpretation of their song lyrics. They have no problem with that. But when with conservatives, this guy, it's clearly a conservative protest song. Guy's likely an Alex Jones fan, likely right winger himself. But then he wants to pretend that there's that there's absolutely no right wing interpretation of his song, and he disavows on any of it. And it's like, what? <laughs> it's a smart career move because he doesn't want to be relegated to the conservative ghetto. He wants to expand beyond the conservative consumer demographic and become a regular country star. And he knows that, uh, in the words, uh, to paraphrase Michael Jordan saying that Republicans buy shoes too. You know, he wants to say Democrats buy records too, or download iTunes songs. And he wants to, and for a lot of the traditional country music audience, a lot of them are liberals. And they don't really want to be supporting the guy who's the conservative protest songwriter. They want to, they would prefer that he be more centrist and just uh, focus on more generic stuff uh, due to con country, um, what country music, that type of particular brand of country music fans want and this goes back to my other theory saying that like you know the pop country stars are more likely to be conservative than the traditional country stars and in part this is due to the audience is the people who are seeking out the like less mainstream uh the country music not being played on the radio are more likely to be liberal than the ones listening to con pop country the pop country people are all like trump supporters that's what they enjoy that's what they like 
And they don't mind their country artists releasing like uh, go to hell liberals or try that in a small town. Funniest thing is Jason Aldean did try to say like, oh, uh, my song has no political interpretation. I disavow conservatives liking it. I disavow any right wing interpretation. It's clearly like a Trump anthem. It's clearly like the anthem of white backlash. And Aldean is totally fine with that and being anti-liberal. Well, and I always said the, the content Song quality is a different matter, but I think the song, the message of Try That Small Town is much better than Richmond, North of Richmond. Uh, much more of an identitarian message in Try That in a Small Town. But he didn't disavow that. But with pop country artists, they're more willing to be open Trump supporters and openly say that their music is a you know protest against Brandon or protest against Biden. While the traditional country artists, even the ones that make an obviously conservative protest song, want to disavow that because a large percentage of their audience are liberals because that's who seek liberals are, are music fans. The ones who seek out less mainstream music are more likely to be left leaning than those who consume the pop country. So that's uh, that's something to consider there. So it's understandable for his career why he did this is that he wants to expand beyond that and not just be a conservative conservative novelty songwriter. But at the same time, it is really funny because conservatives are such a cheap date that they will still defend this guy even though... I mean, there's not... If they like the song, they like the song. But it is a little bit undermining the power of conservative, the conservative market is that some guy could just say, uh, my whole song is, was... A hit thanks to this market but I really don't want to be tied too closely with them it's it's just funny it'd be like Tyler Perry being like oh no 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 my movies aren't black movies they're uh, they're for everyone I, I don't know why anyone would interpret them as black movies you know it's it's basically saying your core demographic that makes your your song a success that's not your core demographic you don't want to be tied to them um, but I think it'll still work because the response on Twitter, like people have really embraced this guy as a symbol of themselves and they really get mad at anyone who criticizes him and dares to say that there's a different interpretation of him than what they perceive him as. And they and so they get very mad at any these type of reactions towards him, and they still will defend him no matter what. So they're kind of they're once you gain the loyalty of the conservative consumer demographic, they're a cheap date. You can write whatever you want and do whatever you want, and they'll still support you if you capture their love and attention, which Oliver Anthony has. And I don't know if he really intended all this to happen. He probably is still struggling with the success of this song. I mean, if you look up any of these artists who went from a nobody to somebody due to a number one hit. I mean, Nirvana, I don't want to compare him to Kurt Cobain, but Nirvana had, the, <laughs> but Nirvana is a good case of this where, you know, Nirvana was just, a, a, you know, an indie rock, alternative rock band that no one had really heard of. And then they became the biggest band in America. And he really struggled with that attention. And so that's the same probably with Oliver Anthony. He's like, he doesn't really know what to do with the attention and he's trying to do what's best for his career to become a standard country artist rather than a conservative novelty hit maker. Uh, but that's what it is. I think it's just funny that he would disavow an obvious, the obvious meaning of the song just to further his career. But most conservatives seem to be accepting it and most conservatives weren't upset by his diversity comments. They have embraced this guy as their own as a symbol of themselves and what they want to see themselves as because, I mean, the original song, The Rich Man, North Richmond, is what the modern right wants to see itself as this multiracial working class element against these rich, corrupt DC politicians who are putting down the hardworking man. And they really want to see themselves symbolized by this song. And no matter what Oliver Anthony does, they will, unless he releases like a pro transgender song or a duet with Dylan Mulvaney, he will still have the loyalty of that bass and nothing will change that. And it's not like the worst thing in the world, but I do find it a little, I think people soy jack to the song a little bit too much. I don't think it was supposed to be the right wing anthem. The right wing anthem is try that in a small town which people did embrace but not to the same extent because had a bit more uncomfortable meaning for them they'd rather have multicultural working class vague populism against the dc politicians rather than white <laughs> middle americans versus the new americans are the minority hordes as expressed in try that in a small town 
But I, I don't think it was ever. I think it was just a standard country song. I think conservatives made a little bit too much out of it, and the fact he's now disavowing that obvious interpretation of the song is showing that they should be a little bit more careful about doing this in the future. And instead, just embrace "Try That in a Small Town" as their anthem rather than "Richmond, North of Richmond." So that's that is my thoughts on that. And now we're going to the Cotton Leap questions. As a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me questions or suggest guests and topics if you sign up for the highly or if you sign up for the cognitive, cognitive elite option at highly respected Substack, and that's at highlyrespected.substack.com, and make sure to sign up for the IQ supplements while you're there. And the first question comes from Dave, and we'll choose the music question because he's asked, he's saying a lot of millennials are gaining a newfound appreciation for Creed and, and for other bands of that ilk uh, now in their nostalgic years. And he's saying, was all the hatred for Scott Stapp, who was the singer for Creed, all a psyop in the 2000s? That is interesting because both Creed and most incredibly Nickelback are receiving appreciation now that they were lacking in the late 2000s and the and 2010s. Is that at that era, Nickelback was seen as the worst rock band. It was such a joke that even... Mark Zuckerberg made jokes about it. That's how that's how popular it was. Is once Mark J Zuckerberg makes jokes about listening to Nickelback, then everyone then that's really when you know the joke has jumped the shark. But everyone agreed, or said that they agreed with the idea that Nickelback and Creed, which generally in the same category of bands, but they were both seen as the worst bands ever, and that only an idiot would try to listen to it. But now everyone's coming around to like, you know what? Creed and Nickelback are actually awesome. And Nickelback's having a big tour right now with surprisingly mostly country artists, which is indicating who their uh, fan base is, what our fan base are, who their fans are, <laughs> who their fan base are, fans are. And it's like flyover country, middle Americans who also enjoy country music. And that's the same with most active rock. I mean, if you look at the active rock category, it dovetails or it's very similar with the pop country category. It's the same guys listening to Borough Country are also listening to Breaking Benjamin and Nickelback and Three Doors Down. These whatever the active rock stations are still playing, which is the same stuff they were playing when I was a kid 20 years ago or you know over 20 years ago because i we used to listen to active rock station when i uh, as a kid and they're playing the same shit now that i was that they were playing then but then it would have been new it'd be like oh the new corn song now it's well they're still playing the new corn song but they're also playing the old corn song too but yeah, no, there's now this new appreciation for these bands that everyone hated at the time. And maybe it is millennial nostalgia because all the time this this stuff comes around. But also it's getting into a lot of the Zoomers. Uh, with Nickelback and Creed, I don't think compared to a lot of the shit that came after them or to other stuff, they're not that bad. Like, I, I think Creed is probably a little bit better than Nickelback. There is definitely a goofiness and cheesiness to them, but... Uh, you know, they're far better than new metal <laughs> and they're uh, far better than the rock that followed them. I would even say they're superior to grunge. I mean, there's, uh, you know, an anthemic quality to them, an uplifting quality to them that there's not found in grunge. You know, they're basically combined some good elements of hair metal with uh, not so good elements of grunge and made a much better uh, music. I would not say would I say it's like really good. No. When I listen to it in my spare time outside of like a joke or like, I want to listen to this song because I heard this song all the time as a kid. Yeah, I would probably do that. But would I actually say it's good? No. But would I say it's like terrible? Was it the worst music ever? No. Uh, the real downside of this is that now that type of nostalgia for late 90s, early 2000s music is also extending to the worst music of all time, which is new metal, which as a kid, I love new metal because... That's like showing, uh, like a real young kid, uh, showing that I wanted to listen to metal. I liked the energetic and aggressive music, and all that I had before me as like an eleven-year-old was new metal. But uh, once I got into real metal, I hated it. And as even nostalgia, I hate, hate new metal. If, like even I hear Corn, it's like this is terrible. Like this is horrible. And the other bands get even worse. Slipknot's terrible. Mudvayne's terrible. Coal Chamber is terrible. 
all of this is just terrible. And then you look at the outfits and stuff that they're wearing. It's now mainstream Zoomer culture, though, what they're wearing. It's this like baggy clothes and dyed hair and bizarre piercings and stuff. And I, yeah, once you get into real metal, you would actually fucking hate new metal. So I don't really like the nostalgia for new metal arising, as most of the listeners should know. But it's all, but it's driven, uh, I think the Creed and Nickelback phenomenon is driven more by millennials now wanting to listen to the music too they listen to as kids. And they're no longer, you know, blinded by this idea that this is the worst music ever and this is like beneath them. That they're now, you know, adults, they're in their 30s. You know, they don't really care about looking cool with what music they like. They're just listening to whatever they want to like, want to listen to. It's not about being hip and cool anymore. And they're listening to Pop Country and Nickelback so and Creed. So I think it's a lot in there. I would not say it's the worst music ever. Uh, that would go to new Metal if we had to pick a, uh, a genre which was around from that same time. So, but the new metal thing is not just driven by millennial nostalgia. That's also driven by Zoomers now getting into it. I think it's even more so driven by Zoomers uh, getting into it because it's not really music that like people in the thirties, you know, with their kids around that they're going to like, you know, play freak on a leash. It's going to be more if you're like a kid and the Zoomers really like it and are getting into it much more so probably than Creed and Nickelback. But so two different things going on, but similar trends. And the second question comes from who else but New England refugee? How to make sure that he got a question. And we always love New England refugees questions. Some people are like, no more New England refugee questions. Like, no, we need more New England refugee questions. And anyone could ask as many questions as possible. It'd be awesome if we had the same, you know, like 10 people all asking questions. And maybe they're all the same 10 people. But he always asks very good questions, so we're always happy to have New England Refugee send in his questions. And he sent over an article from the New York Times. He said, hey, Scott, came across this article. Seems like decent analysis to me. What do you think about the voter breakdown? And the article is the six kinds of Republicans. And the six kinds of Republicans that are outlined, it's, I, I do am a little bit leery or skeptical of the percentage of they put it for Republicans. But I think this is a useful way of seeing the Republican Party and all its different voters. The first is the moderate establishment, which is they Times says is 14% of the Republican electorate. It's highly educated, affluent, socially moderate, or even liberal, and often outright never Trump. And it sees this in like Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins. The traditional conservatives, old fashioned economic and social conservatives who oppose abortion and prefer corporate tax cuts to new tariffs. They don't love Mr. Trump, but they do support him. This would be somebody like Mike Pence. The right wing, they watch Fox News and Newsmax. And traditional conservatives are put at 26% of the party. The right wing, which is 26% of the party as well, they watch Fox News and Newsmax. They're very conservative. They're disproportionately evangelical. They believe America is on the brink of collapse, or catastrophe, as they say. And they love Mr. Trump more than any other group. This would be most of their politicians, like the Freedom Caucus and people like that. Uh, some of them don't. I mean, they're uh, trying to win over, DeSantis trying to win over. And then the blue collar populists, they're mostly northern, socially moderate, economic populists who hold deeply conservative views on race and immigration. Not only do they back Mr. Trump, but he himself probably counted as one a decade ago. I don't, they try to make uh, representatives of this, which they find like Rudy Giuliani, which I don't. Uh, Rudy Giuliani was not deeply conservative on immigration at all. He was always like a big Im immigration backer. So there's not really a good. Uh, representative of this, maybe Paul LePage, uh, former governor of Maine, that they also include. But there's definitely a lot of voters like that. Then the libertarian conservatives, they're disproportionate, which they say blue collar populists put at 12% of the party. Libertarian conservatives, 14% of the party. These disproportionately Western and Midwestern conservatives value small government. They're relatively socially moderate and isolationist, and they're on the lower end of Trump support compared with other groups. The newcomers, they don't look like Republicans. They're young, diverse, and moderate. But these disaffected voters like Democrats and woke left even less. So I don't really agree with the percentages. And I think a lot of the voters are all over the place. But the elements within the Republican base, I think this is a good way of looking at it, of how 
these voters operate and what type of voters you need to get everyone to come together on. And it's probably it's far more useful to look at this rather than the traditional way of looking at it, which was always stupid. It's like, oh, well, we're the three legged stool of foreign policy hawks, social conservatives and fiscal conservatives coming together. And that's really not reflective of what voters care about. That is not a good, you know, how many voters it's like their main concern is fucking foreign policy. Very few. That's just Washington, D.C. think tankers. What percentage of voters it's, you know, and the social conservatives and the fiscal conservatives a lot of times have like different interests. And it's better a way of putting these into a class way of viewing these things or as these as like ordinary voters rather than people working in Washington, D.C. You could say that type of fusionism was important for conservative media and conservative journals and think tanks, but it's not important when it comes to Republican base. They've had these type of breakdowns before. I remember there was one in like 2016 where there was some type of blue collar populist element, which was rated much larger and it was seen as a Trump backing element. I remember this from back in the 2010s that they did this. But this is, I think, a good breakdown of the party as it exists now and what type of issues they care about. Uh, what percentage, you know, do they fit neatly? Do all voters fit neatly into this category? Probably not, but it is much better a way of seeing how the party operates now rather than before. The moderate establishment, I think, is made a lot larger. I think a lot of those people switch over to the Democrats. The newcomers are, I, I think they kind of border on with the libertarian conservatives because a lot of these, and libertarian conservatives I think isn't the best way of saying this because they, they really are highlighting more just Midwestern, rural Midwestern voters, which they're less care about racial and identity issues because they're surrounded by whites <laughs> and, and they're not as, uh, aware of these issues as say voters in the south are or in the northeast are or really in the rust belt it'd be like iowa voters and maybe they're not quite libertarian but they just want to be left alone and they're really skeptical of their tax dollars being used for foreign interventions but i think these are useful categories to see where the party is and where it's going uh i'd say the only pro problem I would have with, with it is the breakdown. I'd probably more examine this a little bit more in what the party is at now and what categories I would use. I would probably put the categories a little bit differently, but I think it's much more useful than past ways of viewing the Republican Party and past ways of viewing the conservative base. I think it's a pretty useful way of, uh, of describing the party where it exists now. So that's my short answer on that. That's my answer on that. But we appreciate all the Codably questions and we would like even more of them if you want to send them our way so with that that's it for today's episode hopefully you guys enjoyed it we've got more incredible content coming later this week but an important reminder next week it's a holiday we have labor day and i'm not going to be laboring on that day i'm going to be taking the day off so Next week's Highly Respected, I may do an episode on Tuesday or I may just do an unlocked IQ supplement to cover the whole week on Wednesday. Depends on how much news happens. If there is a lot of news, we'll do the episode on Tuesday. If it's a slow news week, slow news weekend, not a lot of news, we'll probably do a big episode on Wednesday or Thursday IQ supplement unlocked for everyone. Won't have to, you, even though you should buy, you should get a IQ supplement subscription. If you're for whatever reason, don't want to get one, we will have the episode up for you. So we will be on the lookout for that. So until next time, stay respected.